Section 14 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 3, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay. Margaret of Anjou, Chapter 2, Part 1. Queen Margaret, on the approach of York's army, had retired to Greenwich, with her ladies and the infant prince, where she remained in a state of agonizing suspense during the Battle of St. Albans. The news of the fatal blow the royal cause had received by the slaughter of her brave friends and the captivity of the king her husband plunged her into a sort of stupor of despair, in which she remained for many hours. Her chamberlain, Sir John Wenlock, whom she had advanced to great honors and loaded with benefits, took the opportunity of forsaking her and strengthening the party of her foe. He was chosen speaker of the Yorkist parliament, which King Henry had been compelled to summon. The king's wound was dangerous, and the alarm and excitement he had undergone brought on a relapse of his malady. So that, when the parliament assembled at Westminster, July 4th, he was declared incapable of attending to public business and the Duke of York was commissioned to attend in his name. It was in this Parliament, made up of her enemies, that Queen Margaret was, for the first time, publicly censured for her interference in affairs of state, it being there resolved, that the government, as it was managed by the Queen, the Duke of Somerset, and their friends, had been of late a great oppression and injustice to the people. The King was petitioned to appoint the Duke of York protector or defender of the realm, because of his indisposition, and sith he would not come down to them, that his commons might have knowledge of him. Henry, being then in the Duke of York's power, was not permitted to reject this petition, but it was repeated and urged upon him many times, before he would accede to it. As soon as the Duke of York got executive power of the crown into his hands, he resigned the custody of the king's person to the queen, and enjoined her to withdraw, with him and the infant prince, to Hertford Castle without fail. Margaret was not in a condition to resist this arrangement, but soon after found means to remove to the palace of Greenwich, with these helpless but precious objects of her care, and appeared entirely absorbed in the anxious duties of a wife and mother. It seemed, says one of her French biographers, by her conduct at this period, as if she deemed nothing on earth worthy of her attention, but the state of her husband's health and the education of her son, who was a child of early promise. Meantime, however, she strengthened the party of the Red Rose, by holding frequent secret conferences in her retreat at Greenwich, with the surviving princes of the Lancastrian family, and the half-brothers of King Henry, the young gallant Tudors, who were nearly allied in blood to herself. She had gathered round her withal a band of ardent and courageous young nobles and gentlemen, whose fathers were slain at St. Albans, and who were panting to avenge their parents' blood. Having thus prepared herself, Margaret remained no longer passive than the arrival of the eagerly anticipated moment, when the abatement of the king's indisposition warranted her in presenting him before his parliament. A great meeting of her adherents was previously convened at Greenwich, unknown to the Duke of York, in which the preliminary steps for this design were arranged, and on the 24th of February, 1456, King Henry entered the House of Lords, in the absence of the Duke of York, and the leading members of his faction, and declared, that being now, by the blessing of God, in good health, he did not think his kingdom was in any need of a protector, and requested permission to resume the reins of empire. The parliament, being taken by surprise at the unexpected appearance of their sovereign among them, and the collected and dignified manner in which he addressed them, immediately acceded to his desire. The same day an order was sent by King Henry to the Duke of York, demanding the resignation of his office. York, Salisbury, and Warwick were fairly checkmated by this bold move of the Queen, and retired into the country. Margaret then caused the heir of the late Duke of Somerset, Henry Beaufort, to take the office of Prime Minister, and Henry bestowed the seals on his beloved friend Wainfleet, Bishop of Winchester. Henry's health being still in a perilous state, 
Queen Margaret took great pains to amuse him with everything that was likely to have a soothing influence, and to keep him in a tranquil frame of mind. There is, in Reimer's Federa, an order in council stating, that the presence of minstrels was a great solace to the king in his sick state, and therefore the bailiffs and sheriffs of his counties were required to seek for beautiful boys, who possessed musical powers, to be instructed in the art of minstrelsy and music, for his service in his court, and to receive good wages. Henry was also amused and comforted by receiving daily requests from his nobles, and others of his subjects, for leave to go on pilgrimages to various shrines in foreign parts, to pray for the re-establishment of his health. And not unfrequently was he beguiled with hopes that his bankrupt exchequer was about to be replenished with inexhaustible funds, by the discovery of the philosopher's stone, by one or other of the learned alchemists, who were constantly at work in the royal laboratory. The regal authority was, at this period, exercised in his name by Queen Margaret and her council, with great wisdom and ability. Yet the impetuosity of her temper betrayed her into the great imprudence of attempting to interfere with the jurisdiction of the Londoners, by sending the Dukes of Buckingham and Exeter, with the royal commission, into the city, for the purpose of trying the parties concerned in a riot, in which several persons had been slain but the populace raised a tumult, and would not permit the dukes to hold a court. After several riots, Queen Margaret, not considering the person of the king safe in London, removed him to Sheen, where she left him under the care of his brother Jasper, while she visited Chester, and other towns in the Midland counties, to ascertain how the country gentry stood affected to the cause of the crown. Having every reason to confide in the loyal feelings of that portion of their subjects, Margaret decided on bringing the king in royal progress through the Midland counties, and keeping court for a time at Coventry. Nothing could exceed the enthusiastic welcome with which the king, queen, and infant prince of Wales were received by the wealthy burgesses of that ancient city. On their arrival, Margaret was complimented with a variety of pageants, in which patriarchs, evangelists, and saints obligingly united with pagan heroes of classic lore in offering their congratulations to her on having borne an heir to england and they all finished by tendering their friendly aid against all adversaries there are curious original portraits of henry the sixth and margaret of anjou wrought in tapestry still preserved in st mary's hall at coventry probably the work of a contemporary artist in that species of manufacture which, we need scarcely remind our readers, is not very favorable for the delineation of female beauty, but highly valuable as affording a faithful copy of the costume and general characteristics of the personages represented. Margaret appears engaged in prayer. Her figure is full length. Her hands rest on an open missal, which is before her, on a table covered with blue cloth. Her headdress is a hood richly bordered with pear pearls, which hang around her face. On the summit of the hood is a crown of fleur-de-lis, which bends to the shape of the hood at the back of the head. Behind the hood hangs a veil, figured and fringed with drops shaped like pears. On the temples, and in front of the hood, are three oval-shaped gems of great size. The queen wears a rich collar necklace, made up of round pearls and pendant pear pearls. A chain is suspended round her neck. Her dress appears brocaded. It is of a yellow color, cut square round the bust. The sleeves are straight on the shoulders, but gradually widen into great fullness, which turns up with ermine. This style is called the Rebras sleeve, and nearly resembles the modes of Anne of Bretagne, queen of Charles the Eighth of France, who was almost a contemporary of Margaret. With the exception of the crown, so oddly placed on the top of the hood, the whole costume is similar to the dress of that queen. The maternal tenderness of the queen, and the courageous manner in which she had upheld the rights of her royal husband, and devoted herself to the care of his health, her brilliant talents, her eloquence and majestic beauty, were at that time calculated to produce a powerful effect on the minds of all whose hearts the rancor of party had not steeled against her influence. The favorable impression made by Margaret in that district was never forgotten, and Coventry, 
where she held her court, was ever after so devoted to her service that it went by the name of Queen Margaret's safe harbor. York, Salisbury, and Warwick were summoned to attend the council at Coventry, but these lords, mistrusting the queen in Somerset, retired to three remote stations. York to his demesnes on the marches, where he had the state and power of a sovereign, Salisbury to his castle at Middleham, in Yorkshire, and Warwick to his government of Calais, of which he, unfortunately for the cause of Lancaster, retained possession. The French and Scotch availed themselves of the internal troubles of the realm to attack England this year, on which the Yorkists took advantage of the aggression of her countrymen to work upon the strong national prejudices which were more powerfully felt at that era, perhaps, than at any other period, to excite the ill will of the people against the queen, as if Margaret could have preferred the interests of her aunt's husband to her own, and that of the father of the child whom she loved with such proud and passionate fondness. So alarming, indeed, did the conduct of France appear to Margaret at this crisis, that she was the first to suggest the expediency of a reconciliation between the court and the adverse party of York and Warwick, that the whole strength of the realm might be employed against the foreign invaders. York and Warwick, by whom Margaret was equally hated and mistrusted, paid little attention to her pacific overtures. But when King Henry, in the simplicity and sincerity of his heart, wrote with his own hand a pathetic representation of the evils resulting from this protracted strife, and protested, upon the word of a Christian and a king, that no vengeance should be inflicted on any individual for past offenses against the crown, they felt it was impossible to doubt the honor and honesty of his intentions. A general congress or pacification between the belligerent lords was then resolved upon. To the Lord Mayor of London, Sir Godfrey Boleyn, was assigned the arduous office of guardian of the public tranquillity on this extraordinary occasion. And for this purpose, ten thousand of the citizens were armed, and patrolled the streets day and night, as a national guard, to prevent the plunder and bloodshed that were only too likely to arise from quarrels between the followers of the hostile peers. On the 15th of January, 1458, the Earl of Salisbury, with five hundred men, arrived, and took up his quarters at his own mansion at Cold Harbor. The Duke of York, with four hundred, lodged at Baynard's Castle. The Earl of Warwick arrived from Calais in February, with a pompous retinue of six hundred men in scarlet coats. The Dukes of Somerset and Exeter, with eight hundred followers, lodged without Temple Bar, in and about Holborn, and other places in the suburbs. The Earl of Northumberland and his kinsman, Lord Egremont, maintained the feudal state of the Percys by bringing 1,500 followers, being more numerously attended than any of the other adherents of the Red Rose. How such a congress ever came to anything in the shape of an amicable treaty must remain among the most marvelous of historic records. Two whole months were spent in fierce debates and angry recriminations, before the mediations of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the other prelates, produced the desired effect. The king and queen were easily satisfied, for they required nothing more than a renewal of homage, in which the names of Queen Margaret and her son Edward, Prince of Wales, were to be included. But the lords demanded pecuniary compensation of each other, for the damage they had sustained, not only in the plundering of their respective castles and estates, but for the loss of kinsmen. The king and queen, who had not considered it prudent to trust their persons before, among the armed negotiators of the peace, made a public entry into London, and took up their abode, March 27th, in the bishop's palace, which was a central position. The feast of the Annunciation was appointed as a day of public thanksgiving for this pacification, when the king and queen, wearing their crowns and royal robes, attended by all the peers and prelates, walked in solemn procession to St. Paul's Cathedral, and, in token of the sincerity of their reconciliation, the leading members of the lately averse factions walked hand in hand together, being paired according to the degree of deadly animosity that had previously divided them. The Duke of Somerset, coupled with the Earl of Salisbury, his ancient foe, headed the procession, followed by the Duke of Exeter and the Earl of Warwick, in unwanted fellowship. 
Then, behind the king, who walked alone, came the Duke of York, leading Queen Margaret by the hand, apparently on the most loving terms with each other. The delight of the citizens of London at this auspicious pageant manifested itself, not only in acclamations, bonfires, and other signs and tokens of popular rejoicings, but called for some of the halting lyrical effusions of their bards in commemoration. No sooner was that dissimulated love day, as Fabian calls it, over, than York withdrew to the marches, Salisbury to Yorkshire, and Warwick to his government of Calais. He was at that time Lord Admiral by patent, and thus the whole naval force of England was at the Duke of York's command, undoubtedly a great oversight on the part of the Queen. The animosity between the Queen and Warwick was not of a political nature alone, but, having been founded on a personal pique, was marked by all the bitter and vindictive feelings of private hatred. It was possible for Margaret to assume an appearance of regard for York, but she never could mask her antipathy to Warwick. It was, in all probability, from him that the scandalous imputations on her honor had first emanated, an injury no woman can be expected to forgive, much less a queen. Warwick complained of the rigor with which the queen caused an inquiry to be pushed against him, for a recent act of piracy he had committed, by plundering the Lubeck fleet on the high seas. He accused her of insincerity in the recent act of reconciliation, and of having little regard for the glory of the English arms. These expressions, being repeated in the city, caused a seditious tumult against the queen, in which her attorney general was killed. The governors of Furnival's, and Clifford's, and Baynard's inns, with Taylor, the alderman of the ward in which the fray took place, were committed to prison. This was followed by a personal attack on Warwick, by the royal servants, as he was returning from the council at Westminster Palace. Warwick construed this riot into a premeditated plot, devised by the queen for his destruction. Margaret retaliated the charge by accusing him of causing a tumult at the palace, and, according to Fabian, she actually procured an order in council for him to be arrested and committed to the tower. This fracas, whether originating in design or accident, occurred in a fatal hour for the queen, by affording a plausible excuse to the great triumvirs of the adverse party, York, Salisbury, and Warwick, for drawing the sword once more against the house of Lancaster, which was never again sheathed till it had drunk the lifeblood of those nearest and dearest to Margaret, her husband, and her son. King Henry, leaving his queen to struggle with these difficulties, retired to pass that Easter at the Abbey of St. Albans. At his departure, having naught else to bestow, he ordered his best robe to be given to the prior. His treasurer heard the command with consternation, well knowing the poverty of the royal wardrobe was such that Henry had no other garment suitable for state occasions, nor the means of providing one at his need. So, stepping up to the prior, he offered to redeem the robe for fifty marks. Henry unwillingly complied with this prudent arrangement, but he charged the prior to follow him to London for the money, which he made the reluctant treasurer disperse in his presence. The following June, 1459, the court departed from the metropolis. Queen Margaret took the king in progress through the counties of Warwick, Stafford, and Cheshire, under the pretense of benefiting his health by change of air and sylvan sports. She was accompanied by her son, the young Prince of Wales, then in his sixth year, a child of singular beauty and promise, for whom she engaged the favor of all the nobles and gentlemen in those loyal counties by causing him to distribute little silver swans as his badge wherever he came, and to all who pressed to look upon him. Margaret displayed peculiar tact in adopting for her boy the well-remembered device which had distinguished his renowned ancestor, Edward the Third, whose name he bore. So well were her impassioned pleadings in his behalf, seconded by the loveliness and winning behavior of the princely child, that ten thousand men wore his livery at the Battle of Bloor Heath. Queen Margaret witnessed this fierce conflict from the tower of Muckleston Church, a small village, seated on a rising ground in Staffordshire. King Henry was then at Coles Hill, in Warwickshire, 
and Margaret, fearing for his safety, sent Lord Audley to intercept the Earl of Salisbury, then on his march from Middleham Castle, with a reinforcement of four or five thousand Yorkists. Margaret sternly bade Audley bring Salisbury before her, dead or alive. Audley posted himself on Bloor Heath, at the head of ten thousand Cheshiremen, distinguished by the red rosette of Lancaster, and their leaders by the silver swans worn on their breasts, in honor of Edward, Prince of Wales. Nearly three thousand of the flower of Cheshire, cavaliers and yeomen, perished with Audley, their leader. When Margaret, from Muckleston Tower, beheld the fall of Audley's banner, she fled to Eccles Hall Castle. King Henry, who was dangerously ill at Coles Hill, lay stretched on a pallet during the Battle of Bloor Heath, and the only token of consciousness he gave was that, when his people were removing him, he asked in a feeble voice, Who had got the day? Salisbury, through this victory, was enabled to form a junction with the Duke of York's army, and it was expected that the Duke, who now boldly asserted his title to the crown, would speedily attain the object to which all his actions, for the last twelve years, had tended. The energies of Queen Margaret's mind increased, with the perils and difficulties with which the cause of her royal husband was beset. She had, for the first time in her life, looked upon a battle, and though it was the disastrous defeat of Bloor Heath, far from being dismayed, or regarding it as the death blow to the hopes of Lancaster, it appears to have had the effect of rousing a dormant faculty within her soul, the courage and enterprise of a military leader. Hitherto she had fought her enemies from the cabinet, now she had caught the fierce excitement of her combative nobles, and kindled with the desire of asserting the rights of her husband and her son in battlefields. It must be remembered that this martial fever was one of the epidemics of the times in which Margaret of Anjou lived, that the warlike blood of Charlemagne was thrilling in her veins, and, moreover, that she was the countrywoman and was born the contemporary of Joan of Arc, who had proved herself a more successful general against the English than all the princes and chivalry of France. Having fallen back to Coventry, she there made a general rally of the friends of Lancaster, and succeeded in getting together an efficient army once more, and before the end of October, finding the king sufficiently recovered to take the field in person, she prevailed with him to march to Ludlow, where the Duke of York and his adherents were assembled in warlike array. So greatly had the popularity of King Henry increased, in consequence of his appearance in the provinces, that the Duke of York, to his astonishment and confusion, found his own vassals so little disposed to fight against the anointed sovereign, that he thought proper to circulate a report of the king's death, and caused a solemn mass for the repose of his soul to be sung in his camp at Ludford, supposing that he might by this ruse deprive his adversaries of the sacred shield of Henry's name. But the sturdy marchers showed not a whit more inclination to attack the queen, or impugn the title of the infant son of Henry, than they had done to draw the sword against himself. Margaret, having good information of what was passing in the enemy's camp, caused a pardon to be proclaimed in the king's name to all who would return to their allegiance. This was, in the first instance, treated with contempt by the Yorkist leaders, who replied, They knew better than to rely on such a staff of reed, or buckler of glass, as the promises of the king under his present guidance. Urged by his energetic consort, Henry then advanced within a mile of Ludlow Castle. The Duke of York, relying on Henry's conscientious antipathy to fighting, endeavored to play over the same game he had, under similar circumstances, done at Burnt Heath, by addressing a letter to him, full of protestations of his loyal and good intentions, and praying his sovereign to redress the grievances of the people, by eschewing his evil counsellors. But Henry, while under the immediate influence of Margaret's master mind, showed he was not now to be trifled with, and therefore answered the letter of the insurgents by marching up to the gates of Ludlow, where the royal pardon was again proclaimed. This being followed by the submission or desertion of many of the Yorkist soldiers, the Duke and his second son, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, fled to Ireland, and the Earls of Salisbury and Warwick, with the heir of York, Edward, Earl of March, sailed for Calais, leaving the Duchess of York to defend the castle as she could. 
she and her two youngest sons were made prisoners by the king who sacked and plundered the town and castle of ludlow to the bare walls such was the result of the first campaign that was shared by the queen and if we are to credit the assertions of all historians directed by her councils this signal victory having been happily achieved without bloodshed margaret returned in triumph with her royal spouse to her trusty friends at coventry where henry commanded a parliament to meet november twentieth king henry appears to have been more offended at the mass that was said for his soul in the camp of his enemies than at any of their less innocent acts of treason it is mentioned with peculiar acrimony in a bill of attainder passed against york and his party by this parliament as the very climax of their villainies for the security of margaret and the young prince a new and solemn oath of allegiance was framed and sworn to by the peers and prelates of this parliament in which each liegeman after engaging to do his true devoir to king henry added these words also to the wheel surety and preserving of the person of the most high and benign princess margaret the queen my sovereign lady and of her most high and noble estate she being your wife and also to the wheel and surety and honour of the person of the right high and mighty prince edward your first begotten son the king by the authority of the same parliament granted to queen margaret the manor of caution with the appurtenances in wilts and twenty pounds yearly out of the ulnage of cloth in london in exchange for the manor of havering bower which had been settled on her the triumph of the royal cause was brief calais and the naval power of england were at the command of margaret's determined adversary warwick and from that quarter the portentous storm clouds began once more to threaten margaret was at this period personally engaged in courting popularity among the aristocracy of norfolk dame margaret paston describes some of her proceedings while in norfolk in a familiar epistle to her husband which is too rich a specimen of the manners of the times and the arts used by the queen to ingratiate herself individually with the ladies of norfolk to be omitted letter from margaret paston as for tidings the queen came into this town on tuesday last past afternoon and abode there till it was thursday three o'clock and she sent after my cousin elizabeth clare by sharenham to come to her and she durst not disobey her commandment and came to her and when she came in the queen's presence the queen made right much of her and desired her to have a husband the which she shall know of hereafter but as for that he is never the nearer than before the queen was right well pleased with her answer and reported her of the best wise and saith by her troth she saw no gentlewoman since she came into norfolk that she liked better than she doth her when the queen was here i borrowed my cousin elizabeth clare's device necklace for i durst not for shame go with my beads amongst so many fresh gentlewomen fashionably dressed ladies as here were at that time friday before st george how vigilant and unremitting a scrutiny margaret by some indirect means kept upon the conduct of the nobility and gentry at that period and how minute and particular was the information she contrived to obtain of all their actions and even of the proceedings of their servants may be gathered from the following extract from a contemporary letter addressed to sir john paston i beseech you to remember that i have aforetime been accused unto the king's highness and the queen's for owing my poor good will and service unto my lord york and others etc whereof i suppose sir thomas bingham as remembered that i brought him once from my lady duchess of norfolk a purse and five marks three pounds six shillings eight pence therein and to sir philip wentworth another and a hundred shillings therein for their good will and advice therein to my lady and all of us that were appealed for that case notwithstanding the king wrote to my lord by the means of the duke of somerset that we should be avoided from him and within this two years we were in likewise laboured against the queen so that she wrote to my lord to avoid us saying that the king and she could nor might in no ways be assured of him and my lady as long as we were about him and much other things 
as may be sufficiently proved by the queen's writing under her own signet and sign manual which i showed to the lord canterbury and other lords meantime the band of veterans which warwick had brought from calais had swelled into a puissance whose numbers have been variously reported by historians from twenty five thousand to forty thousand men with this force he and his military elevé edward earl of march triumphantly entered london july second fourteen sixty the citizens throwing open their gates for their admittance on the ninth of the same month they measured swords with the royal army at northampton so ardently devoted to her service did queen margaret find the chivalry whom she had arrayed beneath the banner of the red rose to defend the rights of her husband and her son that imagining herself secure of victory she induced the king to quit to the town of coventry and crossing the river neen to encamp with his army in the plain between harsington and sandiford the fiery heir of york then advanced his father's banner and attacked the host of lancaster at seven in the morning with one of his tremendous charges the battle lasted but two hours and was decided by the treachery of lord grey de ruthen who admitted the yorkists into the heart of the royal camp ten thousand tall englishmen says hall were slain or drowned in attempting to repass the river and king henry himself left all lonely and disconsolate was taken prisoner the dukes of somerset and buckingham were the leaders of the royal army buckingham was slain in the battle where also fell another staunch friend of margaret and the cause of the red rose john talbot earl of shrewsbury a son not unworthy of his renowned sire talbot our good doge as he was called in the quaint but significant parlance of his party somerset escaped to fulfil a darker destiny queen margaret was not herself in the battle but with her boy the infant hope of lancaster was posted at a short distance from the scene of action on a spot whence she could command a prospect of the field and communicate with her generals when however she witnessed the treachery of lord grey and the headlong rush of her disordered troops to repass the river they had crossed that morning so full of hope and ardor the pride and courage of the heroine yielded to maternal terror and forgetful of every other consideration but preservation of her boy she fled precipitately with him and a few faithful followers towards the bishopric of durham but durham was no place of refuge for the queen who had previously incurred the ill-will of the citizens by some arbitrary measure or imprudent burst of temper william of worcester relates that queen margaret and the prince of wales were actually captured while flying from eggis hall to chester by john cleager one of lord stanley's servants and spoiled of all her jewels but while they were rifling her baggage of which her attendants had charge she seized an opportunity of escaping with the prince on the road she was rejoined by the duke of somerset and after a thousand perils succeeded in reaching harleach castle an almost impregnable fortress in north wales where she was honorably received and manfully protected by dafin ap jawan ap enion a welsh chieftain who in stature and courage resembled one of the doughty cambrian giants of metric romance in this rocky fastness which appeared as if formed by nature for the shelter of the royal fugitives they remained safe from the vindictive pursuit of their foes while the unfortunate king was conducted to london by those whom the fortunes of war had rendered the arbiters of his fate he was treated with external marks of respect by the victors but was compelled by them to summon a parliament for the purpose of sanctioning their proceedings and reprobating those of his faithful friends during the interval before it met at westminster and while all parties remained in uncertainty as to what had become of the queen and the prince of wales henry was removed for a short time to eltham and permitted to recreate himself with hunting and field sports in which notwithstanding his mild and studious character henry the sixth appears to have taken much pleasure he was under the charge of the earl of march who kept a watch over him the duke of york having received the news of the signal triumph of his party entered london october tenth at the head of a retinue of five hundred horsemen with a sword of state borne before him and riding straight to westminster he passed through the hall into the house of lords 
advancing to the regal canopy and laid his hand upon the throne with a gesture and look implying that he only waited for an invitation to take possession of it but a dead silence prevailed even among his own partisans which was at length broken by the archbishop of canterbury asking him if he would be pleased to visit the king who was in the queen's suite of apartments those belonging to the sovereign having been appropriated to the duke of york's use i know of no one in this realm who ought not rather to visit me was the haughty rejoinder of the duke with these words he angrily left the house the peers by whom these rival claims were to be decided had to a man sworn their liegemen's oaths to king henry and to him they referred the question as to which had the legal claim to the crown himself or his cousin richard duke of york henry though a captive in the power of his rival replied in these words my father was king his father was also king i have worn the crown forty years from my cradle you have all sworn fealty to me as your sovereign and your fathers have done the like to my father and grandfather how then can my right be disputed the king notwithstanding agreed that if he were permitted to wear the crown during his life the duke of york or his heirs should succeed to the royal dignity at his decease henry was next compelled by those who had the custody of his person to give the regal sanction to the peremptory mandate for the return of his consort and son to the metropolis attaching no milder term than that of high treason to a wilful disobedience of this injunction margaret was a fugitive without an army without allies kindred or money when she received this summons together with the intelligence that the rights of her boy had been passively surrendered by his unfortunate sire to the hostile princes of the line of york tidings that would have overwhelmed any other female with despair had the effect of rousing all the energies of her nature into the resistless determination of purpose which for a time redeemed the cause of lancaster from ruin the king of scotland was the son of a lancastrian princess his sister margaret the late dauphiness of france had been closely connected with margaret of anjou both by marriage and friendship and she resolved on trying the efficacy of a personal application to that monarch for assistance in this emergency having caused a report to be circulated that she was raising forces in france margaret quitted her rocky eyrie among the wilds of snowdon where her beauty her courage and the touching circumstances under which she appeared had created among her loyal welsh adherents an interest not unlike that which is occasionally felt for the distressed queens of tragedy and romance the popular welsh song farewell itty peggy ban is said to have been the effusion of the bards of that district on the occasion of her departure the communication between wales and scotland was facilitated for margaret by the proximity of harlech castle to the menai on which it is supposed she embarked with her son and a few trusty followers her negotiations at the court of scotland were prosperous and her measures so vigorous that in less than eight days after she had received the order in king henry's name for her immediate return to london she was at the head of an army had crossed the scottish border unfurled the banner of the red rose and strengthened by all the chivalry of northumberland cumberland lancaster and westmoreland presented herself at the gates of york before the leaders of the white rose party were fully aware that she was in england the duke of york who had by no means anticipated this prompt and bold response to the proclamation he had enforced his royal captive to send to the fugitive queen left london with the earl of salisbury at the head of such forces as could be hastily collected to check the fierce career of the lioness whom they had rashly roused from her slumberous stupor of despair on christmas eve the duke reached his strong castle of sandal where with five thousand men he determined to await the arrival of his son edward who was raising the border forces before this could be effected queen margaret advanced to wakefield and appearing under the walls of sandal castle defied the duke to meet her in the field day after day and used so many provoking taunts on his want of courage in suffering himself to be tamely braved by a woman that york who certainly had had little reason to form a very lofty idea of margaret's skill as a military leader determined to come forth and do battle with her 
Sir Davy Hall, his old servant, represented to him that the queen was at the head of 18,000 men, at the lowest computation, and advised him to keep within his castle, and defend it till the arrival of his son with the border forces. The duke disdaining this prudent counsel, indignantly replied, Ah, Davy, Davy, hast thou loved me so long, and wouldst thou have me dishonored? Thou never sawest me keep fortress when I was regent in Normandy, where the dauphin himself, with his puissance, came to besiege me, but like a man, and not like a bird in a cage, I issued and fought with mine enemies, to their loss ever, I thank God, and if I have not kept myself within walls for fear of a great and strong prince, nor hid my face from any man living, wouldst thou that I, for dread of a scolding woman, whose only weapons are her tongue and her nails, could incarcerate myself and shut my gates? Then all men might of me wonder, and report to my dishonor, that a woman hath made me a dastard, whom no man could ever yet prove a coward. The duke concluded by declaring his intention to advance his banner in the name of God and St. George. Then with his brother-in-law, the Earl of Salisbury, he issued from his stronghold, and set his battle in array in the hope of driving his female adversary from the field. Margaret had drawn up her puissants in three bodies. The central force was commanded by Somerset under her directions, it is said. But it is by no means certain that she played the Amazon by fighting in person on this or any other occasion. The other two squadrons were ambushed to the right and left, under the orders of the Earl of Wiltshire and Lord Clifford and as soon as York had entered the plain, and was engaged by the vanguard, they closed him in on either side, like, says Hall, a fish in a net, or a deer in a buckstall, so that in less than half an hour he, manfully fighting, was slain, and his army discomfited. Two thousand of the Yorkists lay dead on the field, and the ruthless Clifford, on his return from the pursuit, in which he had slain the young Earl of Rutland, in cold blood, on Wakefield Bridge, severed the head of the Duke of York from his lifeless body, crowned it with paper, and presented it to Queen Margaret on the point of a lance, with these words, Madam, your war is done, and here is your king's ransom. The Lancastrian peers who surrounded the queen raised a burst of acclamation, not unmixed with laughter, as they directed the attention of their royal mistress to the ghastly witness of their triumph. Margaret at first shuddered, turned pale, and averted her eyes, as if affrighted by the horrid spectacle thus unexpectedly offered to her gaze. But the instinctive emotions of woman's nature were quickly superseded by feelings of vindictive pleasure, and when she was urged to look again upon this king without a kingdom, who had endeavored to wrest the crown of England from her husband and her son, she looked and laughed, laughed long and violent, and then commanded the head of her fallen foe to be placed over the gates of York. She likewise ordered the Earl of Salisbury, who was among the prisoners, to be led to the scaffold the following day, and caused his head to be placed by that of his friend and brother-in-law, the Duke of York. In the blindness of her presumption, when issuing these orders, she bade the ministers of her vengeance, take care that room were left between the heads of York and Salisbury, for those of the Earls of March and Warwick, which she intended should soon keep them company. End of section 14.